So hello again everyone and welcome back to the full for mornas and to the book of fables that I was saying that I would want to have a look into. Let's start with these last ones. What does this say? Sheriff Big B, the wolf. Here's the picture of the wolf and our normal form. After fleeing the homelands, Big B Fool spent many years wandering through Europe. With a fable colony quickly developing in the New World, Snow White and the Wet Her Top tracked down the wolf and offered him passage to Fable Town. He agreed, and Snow got him with a lycanthropy stained knife to give him the power to change into human form at will. Okay, well, that makes things interesting. Or why, well, I was wondering that he is the big bad wolf, yes, but I didn't think that the big bad wolf would be able to actually uh, turn into human just like that. But that makes his life a lot easier in a way, so that he can have the lycanthropy and then he doesn't even need to be paying money for getting the glamour and all that. Big B became sheriff of Fable Town under King Cole's admi administration, but because of his violent past, many, many fables didn't trust him, and he was banned from ever setting food on the farm. To this day, he struggles to redeem himself in the eyes of the community. Indeed, indeed. A new order with the Snow White in charge. With Crane out of the picture, Mayor Gold has officially appointed Snow White as the director of operations and deputy mayor in his absence. Many would say this promotion is a long time coming since she was instrumental in the establishment of Fable Town and personally ensured that many fables made it to the new world safely. She's also been doing the work of deputy mayor unofficially for years. Mm -hmm. And there was the Fable Town Justice that we read. Then there is Mary's loyalty. Yeah, she did try to protect the crooked man. I'm not sure if he she is actually dead, because the last piece also went into or was shattered. In a way, like a mirror image could have been. Of course, it could have been the fool still that she, Mary, Bloody Mary, actually did die. But I'm not sure about that. Well, Bloody Mary began working for the Krugman many centuries ago. He promised her freedom to do as she pleased, as long as she agreed to act as his personal bodyguard and hitman. Because of the Kruget man's power and influence, Mary never had to worry about getting caught by the authorities. She enjoys her job immensely and would defend the Kruget man to the death. Mostly because she finds it fun. Yeah, not really otherwise loyal, but she has been able to do whatever she pleases while under the Kruget man. And she doesn't really... She didn't care what the crooked man did. She didn't care about the things that the crooked man cared about. She cared about just doing what she wanted to do, having fun and killing and stuff like that. Pretty much, I would say. The big bad fool, Big B's true form. Indeed. I love this form. Big B's true form. Her form is that of a giant 8 foot tall wolf. In addition to his iconic huff and puff power, indeed the huff and puff power, he has also inherited other abilities from his father, the North Wind. For example, Big B is able to hold his breath for an abnormally long amount of time, making it impossible for him to drown. Hmm, interesting. But yes. Uh, it's so fitting that he smokes the half and puff uh, marketed cigars as well, considering that the power he used against Mary, the wind power, the half and puff, is also, well, named half and puff. It's perfect, it fits, fits perfectly. Perfectly. Uh, Winterful. Big piece mother. Yeah, well, <laughs> Bloody Mary mentioned our mother. So, yeah. 
Bigby's mother, Winter, fell in love with the North Wind and bore him seven full cups. But he quickly grew tired of her and left Winter. Heartbroken and alone, she tried to care for her cups despite her grief. She was especially fond of Bigby, but as the runt of the litter, he was often teased by his older brothers. After Winter's death, Bigby's siblings went in shares of their father, but Bigby stayed behind to protect his mother's corpse from scavengers. Oh, loyal to the end. Unfortunately, he was too small to defend her. From then on, he vowed to eat something bigger each day, until he was large enough to confront his father and finally make him pay for the pain he caused his family. Poor Big Me's mother. Pretty picture too. I love this book of fables, I can't say enough of it. The Pudding and the Pie, Vivian and Georgie's Place. Vivian and Georgie met during the exodus from the homelands, and they helped each other survive the long journey to the mundane world. Upon their arrival, however, they found it hard to make a decent living. With what little money they had, they opened the Pudding and Pie. Operating a strip club may not have been the most desirable occupation, but they figured it was better to be in charge of a place like this than be forced through desperation to work at one. That is, of course, true, but still, I wonder, uh, did the ribbons with the magic attached to them come from the Crooked Man, or did Vivian and Georgie really come up using it? already on their own before the crooked man because seriously i don't know why vivian would ever agree to be making more of those ribbons and placing them on other girls especially if there is no way to leave from that situation um how could that ever be a good plan okay no one was supposed to die but uh, then if one starts to work in that kind of a profession does it mean that they can never ever leave? And that's not very nice, is it? Um, it's like, well, after you once start, you're enslaved forever. It's a very bad idea. Very, very bad idea. So, yeah. Vivian's story. The girl with the ribbon. Vivian was the very first to bear the curse of the purple ribbon. Removing the ribbon would result in death, and any attempt to talk about it was thwarted by the spell upon it. As time went on, she tried to live a normal life. Eventually, she married a nice man, but he was constantly wondering about the ribbon around her neck. Despite her pleas for his, him to leave it alone, one night while she was sleeping, he attempted to remove it. As he pulled on the edge of the string, Vivian woke and saw what her husband was doing. In a panic, she pulled away, preventing the ribbons not from being undone. Furious, she tried to express the severity of his action, but her husband was unable to understand. She, she realized then that she couldn't trust him and decided to leave. She lived alone for the rest of her days in the homelands preferring the safety of isolation to the risk of another betrayal. Yeah, understandable, for sure. Life on the farm. I hope that I have heard at least that there should be probably the full of as season 2. So if there is, I do hope that we get to visit the farm. I'm sure we can, because toads were also sent there. So that should be interesting. With its idyllic location and managed community, the farm would seem to be a welcome alternative to aching out an existing in Fable Down. But those who have lived there see it very differently. They see it for what it is a prison, a place where you're free to be who you are and do whatever you please. Except leave. It doesn't help that while vapors who appear human do not have to worry about being sent to the farm, they always seem to feel the leadership roles there. Mm, well, that's kind of stupid. Tiny Tim the Sentry <laughs> the, in, the, in the Crooked Man's place. 
While most fables theorize that their longevity and overall well-being is improved by the Mundi world's knowledge of them, for a select few that does not seem to apply. When a malady or injury is an integral part of a fable story, that notoriety can make recovery nearly impossible. That's what Timey Teen thinks at least, and no medical care or magic crutter, none that he can afford, can heal his leg. Huh. It's interesting also this part where you think that uh, overall longevity and overall well-being, how hard it is to kill a fable, is because of the or, or is improved because of the Monday world's knowledge of them. So in this way, it could be said that Georgie died relatively easily, considering that we just stabbed him once. Woodsman really, really didn't die or even phased about the axe in his head pretty much. And Bigby of course, really hard to kill. Really, really hard to kill. But we, uh, Bigby is such a well-known story. Such well-known stories overall. So as such, I guess that's understandable that it's very hard to kill him. I like the overall concept of all these things. What about the Crooked Man, the Crime Lord? The Crooked Man has slowly built himself into one of the most powerful figures in Fabledown. His operation started with a crooked sixpence and a crooked house. Two things he cared about more than his wife or children, whom he killed rather than let them stand in his way. Okay, so he also killed his wife and children. Awesome. In his rise, the Crooked Man has ensnared many fables in his criminal web, providing them with what they need, but always at the high cost. He is cunning, persuasive, and ruthless. Yes, he is. Okay, we have at least a lot of these things looked. The next was the Crooked Man's Lair. It was a very pretty picture, these ones in here, for sure. Headquarters. Occupied a decentified church, this is just one of the many locations the Crooked Man's operation uses to run the Fable Down Underworld. Its lounge atmosphere makes for a comfortable meeting place unless you are an unwelcome quest. It is completely boarded up to the outside world and the only way in is through one of the many portals. Marked by the door with the Crooked Man's scattering wheel icon, scattered throughout the city, and elsewhere. Well, that's interesting. Scattered throughout the city and elsewhere. What is elsewhere? Where? Where elsewhere? Um, I don't know. Maybe we will never find out. And the bluebirds, bluebirds, money. I know. I always accidentally managed to say bluebird, which is incorrect. And which really troubles me, but I don't know why it just comes so naturally to say like that. Blue beard money. Blue beard's money. One might think that Bluebird donates funds to the Fable Town government for nefarious purposes, seeking special favors, or to have a louder voice in government proceedings, but what he really wants is stability and strength. Because as far as Blue Bird is concerned, Fable Town exists to insulate him from the Mundi world. As much as his money can be a sword, it also serves as a shield. As thus, it's good that he provides the money considering that... Well, if you think about it, it's quite of a... Well, if we would get money from nowhere, what could we actually do? But it's... Still, he shouldn't cut the lines, damn it. He shouldn't be cutting the lines like he does in the end, too. Johan the Butcher. His name is often said in the same bread as that of a baker and candlestick maker of Fabletown. And like those other tradesmen, Johan the Butcher storefront has served Fabletown for ages. Fresh cuts, exotic meats, and even full sides of beef for the vigorous appetites of ochres and trolls. But Johan's business has fallen on hard times, and fallen in with the wrong crowd. As the quality of his produce is declined, and his business turned into a front operation of the Crooked Man, some have started to wonder if they ever really knew Johan. Well, I cannot say too much about that. 
uh, the bootsman's axe and scrawled by druids. Pretty sign. Once just a simple tour of all telling felling trees, the axe became much more when it was inscrolled by druids and marked with their runes. But it truly became an object of le legend when the woodsman used it to slice the big bad wolf from nave to neck in protection of Little Red Riding Hood. It may carry old world charm, but it is simplicity. But it is simplicity of design and quality workmanship make it an effective tool or weapon even today. Ah, oh, the churchy devil, Garden State Coon. I did not like Churchy at all. Not all the fables who came to this world landed in Fable Town. They are those who scattered across the farthest corners of the earth, and they are those who simply prefer the Garden State to the Empire State. Sus is the Churchy Devil. Ripper reports of its appearance have varied. Although most accounts make mention of literary literary wings, but an encounter with a certain axe of legend some years ago has temporarily rendered that feature absent. Certain axe of legend. Um, wonder what that is? Huh. No idea. Still a lot to look into. And I wonder which ones I haven't been able to unlock even. Huh. Well, Acting as a deputy at the time Snow White was, with Ichabod Crane firmly out of the picture and King Cole still absent, the task of leading Fable and falls squarely on Snow's shoulders. She has performed many of the job's duties for a long time, picking up the slack of for a crane. But now that she's fully in charge of the business office, she has to deal with the new level of policing she had not previously been exposed to. <clears throat> The silver bullets, the legends, fools' weakness. The legends of great and magical fools often make mention of their weakness against weapons made of silver, and those tales bear out to be true. The silver bullet Mary shot Big Bee with was not the first, but any of them could be his last. Any zero left in Big Bee's body weakens his system, slows his healing, and can cause long term damage. Bloody Mary, the urban legend. The true history of the person known as Bloody Mary is almost completely unknown, even to fables most acquainted with its members. Her name, Mary, at least, is not up for contention, nor is her penchant for shocking violence and an inlaid resistance to magic and spells, and a strange ability to use any reflective surface as a portal, effectively shortcut in space and time. Though by Mondays to be the wailing, taught by Mondays to be the wailing apparition of a children coast, though any evidence of that is yes, yet unseen. The Ring of Dispel that never worked, the Arturian Band, reputed to be fashioned by a Byzant Byzantine clan in an attempt to ward off a coven of witches, the Ring of Dispel or Dispelling Ring or Magic Cancelling Ring eventually was given to the Lancelot by the Lady in the Lake. Huh. So it's from that story. Recovered by the business office after the emigration to the new Amsterdam, it was assigned to Greenleaf for caretaking. The glamour tubes of the green leaf, the handy disguise. Glamours can be produced in a variety of ways, but one of the most common due to its ease of use is to take a small hollowed out tube or container and place within it several items unique to whoever the caster wants to copy, but which is required for the recreation recreationary charm, two downsides of this type of glamour is that totally unique appearances are completely impossible, and the nature of the vessel makes it quite unstable. Hmm. The on the green leaf, the white deer. Hort Horticulturist, alchemist, and lover of animals, Onti Greenleaf is one of the few rogue witches still living outside of the 13th floor. Unsupervised and unrestricted, rumors 
to have lost a daughter in the homeland, she suffers paranoia and depressive mood swings, and will only venture outside at irregular hours under the guise of an ethereal white deer, an oft whispered spectral of Pook Haven natives. So, he did lose that daughter that was pictured there and what she clamored as in the first place. So, not the happiest ending or happiest life either, I would say. The trip trapped bar, the watering hole that Greg used all along. The oldest bar in the New York City, the trip trap was established in 1725 in secret by Stargard, the legendary Viking and Ripper reprobate as a place for fables to meet and drink and commiserate. Known them as the Cameras Tavern, he eventually lost it in a bet to a tribe of Mountain Charles, who quickly renamed it and made it their own. Holly is the current proprietor, having inherited it from her mother when she died in a boating accident in the early 20th century. Hmm. Interesting. Ah. Oh. A lot we have read, and still some that we need to have a look into. Rock prints we looked into already before. There's the first one from Vivian too. Let's have a look into that. Much of Vivian's Georgic girl. Much of Vivian's past is unknown since she prefers not to talk about her life back in the homeland. She wanted to start fresh Vable down, but she finds herself working for Georgie at the Pudding and Pie. It's not a terrible life. Georgie took a liking to Vivian, so he doesn't make her job take jobs at the open arms. Instead, she plays hostess and helps Georgie ensure complete customer satisfaction. Yeah, well, now we know more know more of her story too. And I just wanted to make sure what the Witching Well actually says. Even though we did read this before, the Witching Well is located in the chamber inside the Goodland Pinnacle, where it is used to dispose of things meant never to be seen again. Dead fables are committed to its depths, as are the most undeemable criminals. No one is entirely sure what lies at the bottom of the well, nor indeed if it has a bottom at all. So yeah, as it says, we don't know if it's bottomless, we don't know what lies in there. We just know what is done with it. As such, it is the customary way of putting out, so to speak, the most unredeemable criminals. But it is widely assumed to be the best way to the final resting place, nonetheless. But when does that happen? How does it exactly happen that they get to the final resting place is another question I do not know. Well, let's read the rest. What's this first of all? Ah, the funeral rites. The long absence, the gaze of a great mother dead is always upon us. Beneath her affectionate eye we fight our battles, we nurse our wounds, we shout our victories, we endure our sorrows, and when we fall she is there. Her embrace is the silence of the mountain, the heavy peace of the stone. Approximately translated, a troll funeral is a sacred ritual, passed down by oral traditions from troll mother to son. It, begun, it begins at sunset with the creation of the cairn, a small pile of stones to represent the many generations of trolls that have traveled and died before them. The foundations upon which the living stand, weapons are divided amongst Troll's closest comrades. The body and the rest of their positions are burned. And though each viewer must speak to the life of the lost, the aeologic hunter would make a monthly plus. <laughs> okay, here's Dr. Swinehart, the army surgeon. Dr. Swinehart is the resident fabled Han physician, so skilled in the art of instrumental surgery that he can safely operate on himself. He served as an army medic for many years, sometimes using his talents to impress the locals. He currently runs the special research section of the Knights of Malta Hospital, so named to discourage people for investigating what is actually a research fables focused health facility. Huh. Interesting. Hans. Clever Hans. Bouncer, janitor, handyman, everything. 
Clever Hans always does exactly as he's told. However, he often misunderstands his instructions and un ends up hurting himself or behaving oddly, as is the case of his noted fable. In the case of his noted fable, where he threw sheep's eyes at his five. I've never heard of such a fable. That's uh, that is very weird behavior. Unsurprisingly, she left him. <laughs> And now Hans works as a bouncer at George's club. He hopes to dance on a stage one day, but for now, he's content sweeping up and making sure the crowd doesn't get out of hand. Huh, interesting. Weird, but interesting. Then there's the beauty and the beast, our little friend, Crane. Then um, Lawrence. The Tweedledees and Dumps, and here is the relic for the troll first of all. Her relic, the troll Lily's Brutes. A troll cross is an amulet made of iron that was foolishly taught to protect the wearer from trolls. Lily acquired hers while wandering through the wilderness searching for something to eat. She came across a human, but before she could devour him, he held the troll cross out and shouted, Back! Back, you troll. After enjoying her tasty snack, Lily plucked the cross, plucked the cross from the dead man's hands. After the exodus, she wore the troll cross constantly as a reminder of better days. Hmm, interesting. Funny story. Georgie the Georgie the Georgie. Georgie Borgie, the pimp. Georgie runs the Budding and Pie, or used to at least, a strip club that also caters to the unmentionable desires of fabled town citizens. He has tried just about everything there is to try in pursuit of worldly pleasures, but none of it satisfies him for long. He does seem to enjoy pushing people's buttons. He takes pride in his nightclub and doesn't react well to anyone meddling in his affairs. That was at least the case. Poor Lily. Estranged sister. The one thing that I hoped that I, we would have been able to do would have been to ask about Lily as well at the time from the mirror. What would have been the mirror's answer? Would it still have been that uh, the lips are sealed or would it have been something else? Because if the mirror would have been able to show the dead Lily then uh, there would be no reason that it wouldn't have been able to show that fate. Mm -hmm. But Lily and her sister Holly grew up in the homelands together, but had a falling out shortly after moving to the mundane world. Aimless and increasingly destitute, Lily turned to the prostitution, and now she's the second victim in an ongoing murder investigation. The mirror mirror of the, on the wall. The magic mirror speaks mostly in rhyme and demands that others do the same. He also requires the name of whatever object or person you wish to find. If you follow these rules, the mirror will show you a glimpse of whatever you want to see, but nothing more. Just a glimpse. The 13th floor that was mentioned, the witches and wizards of Fable Town. The 13th floor of the Woodland Building is a home to a group of witches and which are tasked with the protection of Fable Town. They use their powers to keep the community hidden from prying Monday eyes, but all magic has its limits and every spell has its cost. Of course. Bluebird Mercy. Bluebird's last five. After a long line of marriages resulting in mysterious disappearances, Bluebird's last five in the homelands was naturally suspicious of him. Well, naturally. One day he departed on business, leaving her alone in his estate. He gave her free reign of all the runes, but made her promise not to open the closet on the ground floor. She defied him, of course, and discovered the location of his missing wives. When Bluebird returned, he knew he must kill her before she revealed his murderous secrets. She persuaded him to allow her a moment to pray, which he reluctantly granted. This small mercy gave her brothers time to arrive and rescue her, and Bluebird's crimes were exposed. Huh. Interesting. 
So that's the way he was exposed at the time. And as thus, considering that, it could have been very well fitting that he would have been the killer, but of course he wasn't. Big Beast Mercy. In the days leading up to the Exodus, the Big Bad Wolf hunted armies of men and goblins in the Black Forest. These invading forces had driven off the great beast's preferred quarry, and their own flesh was rotten with corruption. Hardly a suitable replacement, he made it his game to destroy their camps, devour their night watchmen, and disrupt their supply trains while sparing their prisoners. Sparing their prisoners. One day he broke their ranks and discovered a patrical woman they held captive. Her skin was white as snow, but her hair was as dark. Those were the dwarves. The dwarves, better to say nothing more. Her skin was white as snow, but her hair was dark as the night sky. He approached her, and she, knowing not, no sword could match the giant fool's power, bravely placed her shackles in the beast's mouth. He freed her, but years would pass before the two met again in the Mondays world. So that was Big Beast's mercy. These are the damn dwarves that are spoken about. I had driven off the great beast's preferred quarry. Um, men and goblins in the Black Forest. Or is it? I don't know. The dwarves looked quite corrupted, after all, if you consider. Huh. Well, we know who had to be the one that he freed, and that has to be White Snow, Snow White. Why does Snow, Snow White? Indeed. Well, that was very interesting, and he said that better not to mention more about the dwarves when we've looked into the Fable 2 book a long time ago already, so... Interesting. Very, very interesting. So, Holly, the tree trap owner. Holly is a no-nonsense kind of troll, no-nonsense, and the owner of Trip Trap Bar. She's clamored to appear human, but her patrons know better. Holly takes good care of her regulars, often the downtrodden fables with little to spare, but she has no patience for the fabled down government that has done nothing to locate her missing sister. Indeed, I'm sorry about it. The Tweedles. The hired goons. The Tweedle brothers, Dumb and Dee, are attacks for hire. They appear human, allowing them to carry out their contracts in the Monday world without showing suspicions. They are inseparable as they are ruthless. Mm. Prince Lawrence, Fate's husband, who I did not manage to save. After escaping the homelands, Prince Lawrence and his wife Fate immediately fell victim to the harsh realities of the mundane world. They moved to New York, hoping to find aid in a community of fellow fables, but without enough of money to live in a fable town, they had to settle on an apartment on the outskirts of the neighborhood. Unfortunately, that meant they were, set, were out of sight and out of mind when it came to government assistance. Their prospects dwindling, Fate left Lawrence to try to make it on her own. Now, without his wife for support, Lawrence struggles to motivate himself and quickly sinks into depression. Ah, uh, yeah. Sad, sad fate of Prince Lawrence. Poor Prince Lawrence and poor fate. Fable Town, home of the fables. It's a community located on the Bullfin Street in Manhattan Upper West Side. To regular people, or Mondays, it appears to be an ordinary New York neighborhood, but it is really the home of fables from many worlds and within the business office of the woodlands lies a massive cavern, a vast library, a hundreds of magical items of immense power. All non-human fables live upstate on the farm, an extension of Fabletown. 
the crane, the Ichabod crane, deputy mayor of Fable Town, as he used to be. Hailing from the haunted town of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane has been deputy mayor of Fable Town for nearly 115 years. Crane is a bundle of nerves and takes his job very seriously, though that doesn't mean he always does it well at all. As one of the Fable Town's elite, Crane is often blind to the troubles of the less well off citizens. Overall, Crane is authoritarian authority on cowardly and always hiding something. Ah, oh, Colin. Colin is better known as one of the three little pigs. Back in the homelands, they were harassed by the big bad wolf who blew down Colin's house of straw. Oh, poor guy. After the exodus, Colin and the other fables who couldn't pass for human were sent to live at the farm in the upstate New York. Unable to stand such a boring life, Colin constantly makes trips down to Fable Down to border Pigby. He's always caught and sent back to the farm, but he doesn't let that stop him. Okay. Then there's still Beauty and the Beast. Karen 5, Beauty and her husband Beast once lived in an enchanted castle, but they were forced to flee the homelands in the Exodus, leaving all of their wealth behind. Now they live in a modest studio in Fabletown, New York, though times are hard with Beast working in multiple jobs to pay the bills, and couple have the longest lasting relationship of all the Fables. Well, that is something alright, alright? At least they have the longest lasting relationship of all the Fables. Beast, a concerned husband. Beast and his wife Beauty left everything behind when they escaped the homelands in the Exodus. Without his former wealth, Beast must pick up extra work to make ends meet. He's able to get around Fable Down without a clamor most of the time, but if Beauty gets too angry with him, he becomes more beastly by the minute, growing horns and large teeth. Despite the occasional bickering, the two are truly in love and have the longest lasting relationship of anyone in Fable Town. Gladly, they are still both together and well, at least at this point. But that is all of the fables that I am able to read. There are a few that are very much missing. Sadly enough that I cannot open or unlock. Ah, but it was an overall great story. Um, Ah, full moon, okay. And I haven't been able to do that. I haven't been able to unlock everything because I've only played it once through. So, not a possibility. But as said, I really, really love this game. And I hope there will be the season 2 because there was questions left about Nerissa slash possible fate. Was it all the time Nerissa who actually clamored herself to look fate? And tried to go and warn maybe Lily about into the food cut apartment. Was it actually Nerissa in just fate clothing, so to speak, that we saw before or met before? Or is fate somewhere in hiding? Or was fate actually the one that managed to then clamor herself to look Nerissa and has been pretending to be Nerissa now? I don't know. I have no certain knowledge. Is it Nerissa? Is it Fate? Are they both alive? Because Swineheart still has had no... Well, they have brought no information. Or he brought no information about the head either. Actually, I also noticed that there's, funnily enough, these different fables going here. Ah, Snow White is coming there. And we pumped into the woodcutter before previously also. So very fun, this also, where he's just walking about. Walking about in his business, with his glowing yellow eyes. Now I'm just like looking, hmm, who is this? Who is this? Ah, oh, that has to be Beast. Who are you? You're a woodcutter, yep. You are a woodcutter as well. For sure. I don't see uh, Ikapan Crane. I'm sure you're Ikapan Crane. And Snow again. Fate. Police officer. Huh. Lovely. A really nicely done beauty. That has to be beauty. A Lawrence, most likely. Police officers. Beast. 
and beauty at least. Is that again Lawrence? I don't know. Uh, fate. And uh, that was Gren. That was Gren. Okay. Yeah. At least. And Woodcutter bumps into us. I'm not sure who some of the others were, but nonetheless, very nicely done overall. And that has to be Fate. And then there's the snow. The snow white. Lumi Valkoinen. In Finnish, Snow White. But yes, I hope you also indeed enjoyed this. And if you wanted to see the fables, book of fables, at least you were able to do that as well right now. And I at least am very happy to be reading the fable comics as well at some point. Just need to get my hands into them. But probably should wait for the season 2 of Wolf Among Us first before going and reading them because then I might get some spoilers and I don't want to get spoilers about uh, the next game. But thanks for watching, I hope you will join me in the season 2 in the future and I shall see you at least then. See you next time.